And for those of you who are still living in July, August the 13th is tomorrow night. So uh, I presume that's the date of the meeting, is it? <laughs> We're turning to, as Ed Price says, 1 Samuel chapter 17, and this is a lengthy chapter, and for the sake of time, I'm reading some very long portions, but not the entire chapter. So turn with me first to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 4 through verse 11, and then we'll read another longer passage later on. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine? And you, servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now let's turn over to verse 28. David in the meantime has come with uh, gifts for the members of his family who were in the army. And now we read in verse 28, now Elab, his oldest brother heard when he spoke to the men, and Elab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, What have I done now? Was it not just a question? or literally just a word. Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. And David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. And he took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, 
and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had even in his pouch and his sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead and the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and let's bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we approach Thee through the name of our great living God in heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank Thee for the provisions that have been made for us through Him who died for the sins of sinners. We thank Thee and praise Thee for the forgiveness of sins which Thou hast granted to us in grace we thank Thee for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who has brought conviction and conversion. And we thank Thee for the Spirit's everlasting presence in our hearts from the day when by Thy grace we were turned to the Lord Jesus as our own personal Savior. We thank Thee for the guidance Thou hast given to us, the provisions Thou hast made for us, and the hopes that we have by virtue of the blood that was shed. Father, we ask thy blessing upon the whole church of Jesus Christ today. We ask that we may be imbued with something of the spirit of David, the boldness that thou didst give to him for the conflicts that faced him. May the church of Jesus Christ have something of that same spirit as they face the enemies of our day. We ask thy blessing upon Believer's Chapel and its ministries and upon its leadership. We commit them to thee. We pray especially for those who have requested our prayers and for some who are very, very important to us who are very sick. We especially pray for them. We ask that thou will give comfort to them, minister to them, give them the joy and the strength and the consolation and comfort of thy presence in the midst of their trials. We pray especially for those who minister to them. And Lord, we ask for the families. We pray that there may be encouragement and blessing through the experiences of life. 
And Father, we ask thy blessing upon the chapel and its ministers, particularly in the Sunday school, and pray that there may be continued growth and development of our young people through the teaching that they receive and through the provisions that are made for them in these very important years of their lives. We commit our meetings of this day to thee and ask thy blessing upon each one of them, the Sunday school, the Lord's Supper, the ministry of the word meetings, for Jesus' sake, amen. The subject for today as we continue our series of studies, lessons in the life of David is David, Goliath, and David's greater son. Without any doubt at all, one of the most familiar of all the biblical stories is the story of David's slaying of Goliath. I must confess I had a rather erratic Sunday school experience through my early life. My father and my mother sent me to the Presbyterian Church Sunday School in Birmingham, Alabama, and I attended regularly as I remember until I was about 12 years of age. And then when we moved to back to Charleston, South Carolina for my father, I attended there Sunday School until I became so entranced with golf that uh, I discovered the interesting thing that Sunday morning was the best time to play golf because in those days there were people who would be in church on Sunday morning. But uh, my experience therefore was somewhat erratic through the years of my youth, but I must confess that even I, in spite of my Sunday school history, remembered this story, the story of David and Goliath. I wasn't at all sure whether Jonah swallowed the whale or whether the whale swallowed Jonah. I did remember vaguely there was such a story, but this one I do remember and did remember. And I remember the time that I first preached on 1 Samuel chapter 17 many, many years ago. And uh, I was speaking with my son about it, and I happened to say to him that this would be the first time that I'd ever given a message on David and Goliath. And I remember Sam saying, well, that's one of the first things I would preach on, because I know it so well. I guess most of us have something of that experience. We know the story of David's slaying of Goliath. But the spiritual significance of it, I must confess, completely escaped me. I don't want to blame it on my teachers because I wasn't too responsive. But nevertheless, the fact that this might be something of an illustration of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ completely escaped me. I can remember also reading an exposition of this particular chapter and the preacher whose books I have in my library, probably eight or nine of them, a Scottish evangelist and Bible expositor, stood up and gave as his first words to a large gathering, there is one young man that I want especially to address this evening. You are not converted. May God convert you tonight because it's about time. And as I look out over this audience, uh, we, there are young men here, and there may be some who are not converted. But there are olders also who are not converted. And my prayer is that through the ministry of the Word of God, you too may be converted. Probably in Believer's Chapel, most of you know the historical situation. The Philistines and Israel were engaged in constant warfare, the Philistines attacking, then uh, being sent out of the country by the Israelites. At the present time, when this incident occurred, the Philistines had made inroads into the land.
And in the valley of Elah, which is a valley about 11 miles southwest of the city of Jerusalem, the Philistines were gathered on one side of a ravine in verse 3, where we read, and the Philistines stood on the mountains, on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. That word translated valley is probably a reference to the ravine. And the fact that there is a ravine there is probably the reason that uh, Goliath stands on one side and does not seek to come down and up the other side because with the uh, tremendous amount of armor on, it would be difficult for him to do that. But at any rate, there they were in what is now called the Wadi Es Sant, sharp and deep ravine between the two armies within the valley of Elah. And we read in the opening verses of the three individuals who are important in this account. There is Goliath. He is described as a champion twice in this chapter. An interesting word, an interesting expression, because it's not absolutely certain what it means. It means something like a man of two middles, or some have suggested a mediator. At least he seemed to want to act as a mediator for the Philistines. And the expression in the Hebrew text can have a meaning something like that. But at any rate, he was surely a champion. He's described by his height in uh, the fourth verse as six cubits and a span. A great deal of discussion has taken place over that, some wanting to give Goliath height even as high as 11 feet, but probably something around nine feet or just a little bit over. That's not unusual, incidentally. There have been a few like that. There is record of a Russian giant who appeared in Britain in 1905, and he was nine feet eight inches. So it's not totally impossible to have one as large as Goliath was, but he surely was an imposing figure. And then the picture of Saul. Saul, the man who stood head and shoulders above the other Israelites, but we read in verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard these defiant words from Goliath, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Goliath had so intimidated the children of Israel that he had intimidated their champion Saul. And instead of having the fear that comes from the Lord God, the fear of him in uh, the possession of a sound man, Saul is one who is affected with the spirit of the fear of men. And then the description of David that is given in verse 12 through verse 16 we did not read, but uh, we have been speaking about it over the last couple of Sundays, and so I've dispensed with that. So the two armies were opposed to each other in the Valley of Elah, and in order to take care of his sons, Jesse the Bethlehemite, the father of David, sent David with provisions for the members of his family with bread, and he sent him with uh, grain, and uh, tried to make as much provision for him as he could. But David, when he came, heard the defiance of Goliath, and uh, in the verses 23 through 30, the defiance of Goliath is set forth. And David responds to it, as you might expect David to. He says, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? It's very interesting. They think of Goliath. David thinks of Goliath's relationship to God. Notice what he's, how he describes him. He calls him as this, he calls him this uncircumcised Philistine. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he means by that simply this, that he is not 
within the covenantal family. Not having received the sign of circumcision, he's not a person who ostensibly and professedly is one who has received the promises that God has given to Abraham. And so to speak of someone as uncircumcised is to say that they are outside the covenant. In fact, it could be a way of saying he was simply not a believing man. He is not a Christian man, to use terms that don't apply to the Old Testament, but nevertheless express the fact that he is not within the believing community or the professing believing community. So he is the uncircumcised Philistine outside the covenant that God had given in marvelous sovereign grace to Abraham and to his seed. And furthermore, he speaks of him as one who taunts the armies of the living God. So he not only is a person who's outside the covenant, but he himself is a person who has no contact with our God who David regards as the living God. The challenge had been issued. No one had taken the challenge. David asks, why is this so? I can just imagine that an ancient GI might give David a few words of advice. It might be something like this. Now listen, young fella, we've been in the army a short time, but we know enough already that we don't volunteer for anything. And so no one has volunteered to go out and challenge Goliath in combat. So Goliath defies the children of Israel. I have a cartoon in my possession in which there's a picture of a giant and all you can see is from his knee up and then there's a little boy who has a, a sling in his hand by the side of the knee and the sword of the giant is just hanging down so you can see his sword it's obviously a reference to David and Goliath and the young fellow with a sling in his hand looks up and says uh, something like, before we get into this thing, don't you think that we ought to investigate the possibility of binding arbitration? And you don't find anything like that here in the Word of God either. Well, at any rate, David expresses his uh, disturbance over the fact that no one is taking up the challenge of Goliath, and in so doing, seems to express the fact that he would be willing to take up the challenge himself. And so, when the words which David spoke were heard, they were told to Saul, and so Saul sent for him. And he appears before Saul. And if there is one thing that one can learn practically from the experience that David describes of his past, it's that the past is the clue to the present. The means are subordinate to God's leading. Never fight the Lord's battles in Saul's armor. Those are some of the things that one can learn. But at any rate, when he came into the presence of Saul, Saul objected, but David said no, he would fight. And so Saul decided to give him some armor. So he clothed David with his garments, put a bronze helmet on his head, clothed him with armor. David put the sword over his armor, tried to walk because he had not tested them. And then he said to Saul, I cannot go on with these for I have not tested them. And so David took them off. I have a good friend as a Bible teacher. He said when David put on that armor, he walked four steps before the armor moved. And so consequently, he put it off, and we read he took his stick in his hand, he chose five smooth stones, and uh, put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. I'd like to stop just for a moment and make a few comments about the state of mind of David, because the state of mind of David, it seems to me, is the state of mind 
that you and I should seek to cultivate for all of the experiences of life. If you'll listen to what David is saying, his whole trust is in the living God and also in the past experiences that he has had as a result of his trust in the living God. There are some saints, saints, Mr. Spurgeon used to say, who have short memories. They write our benefits in dust and our injuries in marble. Or we inscribe our afflictions in brass while our deliverances are written in water. If our memories were more tenacious of the merciful ways in which God has dealt with us in the past, then in the midst of further trials, we would find the necessary strength to meet them. What did David recollect? Well, he, re reco he recollected the fact that he had been tried before. There was the lion and there was the bear. And not only had he been tried before and God had delivered him, but he had been tried frequently because it was not simply a lion as if it was only one experience, but a lion and a bear. And no doubt, as you read this, you get the impression that this was probably something of the usual experience of the shepherd out on the fields of Judea and where the wild animals were and where his sheep had to be protected. He not only then reflected that he had been tried before and tried frequently, but he had risked everything on account of his duty, which the father had given him, his father, and that was to take care of those sheep. In other words, to do one's duty is what one must do in the midst of trials and trust God for deliverance. He had gone alone into the fray on that occasion with the lion and the bear. And if that has taken place in his past experience, if he has known deliverance, then can he not trust him in the same way now? That's one thing the Bible makes so plain for us. If you read David's Psalms, that's what he writes about. The fact that God has delivered in the past is the hope that he will deliver in the future. And for you and for me, it is the same thing. If we have had experiences of God delivering us, then those experiences are the some of the means by which God encourages us to keep trusting in him. He had nothing visible to rely upon, only the Lord God, alone out on the hills of Judea with the lion and the bear and the sheep that had been given into his hand, and nothing visible but the Lord God. But when one recognizes that he has the Lord God, he doesn't need anything visible. And David had the experiences of God working in his behalf. Notice his tactics, too. They are natural, artless, and vigorous, someone has said. He didn't call for consultation with the committee on lion slaying and bear trapping. Uh, his whole art was faith. This was his science and his skill. And the confidence that he had in the Lord God as he fought vigorously, and those two go together, the confidence in the Lord God and his vigorous fighting gain the victory. I can imagine that David might have said something like this. I wouldn't mind another lion. I can manage lions. I wouldn't mind another bear. I have managed bears. But when I look off and see that nine foot tall Philistine with a sword in his hand, that's a little bit different. I think that perhaps someone else ought to do the duty. But again, in the final analysis, it's the Lord God who is going to take care of him, and consequently, he can count upon him. And he will not do it in Saul's armor, no cumbersome army. And I think the battles of the local church are to be fought in the same way. Our local churches desire to put on all kinds of armor, modern armor, the kinds of things that do not gain the victory of the Lord. Red tape, committees, administrators, secretaries, business managers. Incidentally, there's a new 
There is a new office in many of our churches, the office of business manager, and they sit in the bosom of the church of Jesus Christ, but the essentials are two things, the preaching of the gospel and the walking in the spirit of the believers. These are the two means by which the church succeeds. They succeed by the preaching of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they succeed by the individuals who belong to that church walking in the Holy Spirit. So David puts off Saul's armor, takes a stick in his hand, five smooth stones from the brook, puts them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, his pouch, his sling in his hand, and he approaches the Philistine. This was the great, a great victory for the Lord God through a man. I'm not surprised that David could use his sling with such success. We read back in the book of Judges of some of the Benjamites who could hit a hare with a sling. So they had all day long to train and they were exceedingly skillful in it. John McNeil once said something like, could I miss a man the size of the gable of my father's steading? And so here is a man nine feet tall and David has his sling. Well, this was a setup for the man of God. And that's precisely what happened. Some years ago when I was pastor of the Independent Presbyterian Church, which is now Northwest Bible Church, some of the individuals at that time in that church had come from churches that were relatively liberal. And uh, as a result of it, they had some peculiar ideas about church meetings. And I remember, this is almost 40 years ago, I remember that some of the men suggested that in the men's meeting, actually it was a kind of a church meeting, that we should invite someone outside the church to have some variety. And so there was a man who was a well-known after dinner speaker among churches that they managed to get hold of, and so they invited him to the church meeting. And uh, some of the things that he said were this. He stood up first of all, and he says, I'm a believer. I believe in Santa Claus. That seemed to me rather silly. And then he went on to say, and he was, he read a, or he referred to David and Goliath, that was his text. He said, David got this job because his father knew where he was. He was in the field. And then he proceeded to exhort the men in the congregation to be in the field, be doing something. That was lesson that we obtained from that. But then he gave us an interpretation of the five smooth stones, and this is what I thought was really good. He said, now the five smooth stones signify kindness, courtesy, tact, the fatherhood of God, and the brotherhood of man. And that was the lesson that we received from him in the church meeting. <laughs> I, I was never so disappointed in my life in an evangelical church meeting to have someone come in, talk about the armor of Saul. Who could ever do anything with something like that? Well, the story we've read, David overcomes Goliath, and then we read in verse 54 that he not only overcame Goliath, but David took the Philistine's head, brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his weapons in his tent. And finally, the chapter concludes with an inquiry of Saul regarding David's parentage. Evidently, his, his personal appearance had changed, and Saul, furthermore, was not what he was previously, and there was some question about it. Now, what I would like to do is to, the story is familiar to you. You know the story, at least as well as I do. But there are some lessons in the encounter that I think that we should not miss. And standing out are the typological lessons. Now let me define a type. 
In the New Testament, we read, for example, that Adam is a type of the one to come. Now, we're not going to make much over the term type. A type is simply an example. A type is simply an illustration. Anyone who looks at the term type in the New Testament and examines all of its references will discover that a type is no different from an example. A type is no different from an illustration. It simply is an example, an illustration. Now, typology is the study of historical correspondences in the Word of God. And uh, the value of typology is that it underlines the fact that God controls history, that He is the one who, as the centuries unfold, carries out His eternal purpose. And because He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then the principles by which He acts may, we may expect to be the same. He will act, of course, according to principles of rights, righteousness, justice, mercy, and so on. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And so consequently we may expect to find in the Old Testament anticipations of the way that He will act in the New. In fact, if you can think of these three things when you think of type or example, they will help, I believe. First of all, types are historical. That is, historicity is part of typology. Secondly, correspondence. That is, the events that are the types correspond to the antitypes, the fulfillment of the types. And then, in the light of the fact that the Bible, as well as human history, is the unfolding of the continuing purpose of God, and the antitype is the fulfillment of the type and generally goes a bit beyond the type, then we may add, at least many feel, the term in addition to historicity, correspondence, predictiveness. That is, types anticipate a fulfillment. Now, when we look at this incident, we just think for a moment, David was officially, to use the term officially, a type of Christ. That is, his work anticipates the work of his greater son who would come. Personally, David is simply an example for us. That is, the courage, the faith that he manifested in this incident is the kind of courage and kind of faith that every one of us who are believers in our Lord Jesus Christ should manifest. But officially, he is an anticipation of his greater son. And that is why in the New Testament we read in our Lord, the announcement of our Lord's birth, as well as in the conclusion of his work in the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus is set forth specifically and underlined as the son of David. In other words, God would have us to draw the likenesses between the two. Now, let me just briefly set forth some of the things that make David like our Lord. David came to this battle from his father's house with gifts in his hand. That is precisely what our Lord did when he came in his incarnation. In the book of John, in chapter 16, and verse 28, in the Upper Room Discourse, the Lord makes this statement regarding His ministry. I am come forth from the Father, and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again, and going to the Father. No one would question that our Lord has come from the Father, and He came with gifts in His hand, the forgiveness of sins through His saving work. So, David came to the battle from his father's house with gifts in his hand. So, our Lord. Goliath was his personal antagonist. And Goliath pictures, obviously, Satan himself. We read in the epistle to the Hebrews a couple of verses that I think highlight the truth. 
The writer of the epistle of the Hebrews in chapter 2 and verse 14 and verse 15 says, Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And so Goliath pictures Satan. David came forward thirdly after everything else had failed. There was the Philistine standing out in front of the armies of Israel and saying, give me a man, calling for their mediator in order that they might struggle and settle the issue. Saul and Israel are immobilized. They are shuddering, shivering slaves. And in that, illustrate those uh, who are members of the human race apart from the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. After the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, that's really what we are. We are slaves to sin until the root of David, to use the description given of him in the book of Revelation, until the root of David comes and prevails. Just think for a moment of that great picture in Revelation chapter 5, the book in the hand of the one sitting upon the throne, no one is able to open the book, the apostle weeping, because no one of men has the power to take the book and open it and to accomplish the things that are within it. That is to rule and reign over this earth in the pleasure of the eternal God. And then the Lord Jesus, the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world, comes. The one who turns out to be the lion, but who has purchased out of every kindred, tribe, and tongue, and nation a people. And so consequently, like our Lord Jesus Christ coming after everything is lost, David comes after Israel is immobilized, shuddering, shivering slaves. David prevailed, and the root of David will ultimately prevail as well. It's interesting also to notice that when David comes, his brothers reject him, reminding us of the fact that Israel rejected the greater David when he came. He came unto his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of bloods, not of the will of man, not of the flesh, but born of God. So Israel rejected David the first, but nevertheless he fought for them because of his love for them and love for the name of the Lord God. One further thing, or another thing, David's victory is won by apparently foolish means. Think of it. Here is the great John, clothed in armor from head to foot, with a mighty sword. And here is the young man who approaches him with nothing but a sling and five smooth stones, which he has selected from the brook. A foolish means, one would think. That's precisely what the gospel is called a kind of foolish means for deliverance, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And furthermore, notice that David, he stuns him with the stone. And then as the giant lies on the ground, stunned from the stone, he takes the sword of Goliath out of its sheath and kills Goliath with his own sword. In other words, He overcomes him with what Goliath thinks is his means of victory. And so our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary overcomes Satan with what Satan thinks is his strength. He's going to put him to death. But it's by means of the death which our Lord died that he overcomes. Listen again to the words that the writer of the epistle of the Hebrews writes. Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, 
that is the devil. In other words, there had been delivered to the devil the right to execute death. Evidently, that took place in the ages past of eternity. He had that power. But now comes our Lord Jesus Christ through death, rendering powerless the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. In other words, David slays Goliath with his own sword as our Lord slays Satan with the death that he died. As we say, he death by dying slew. One thinks of the great promise of Genesis 3.15 and the crushing of the serpent's head and our Lord's victory. Furthermore, David spoils the giant then. And we read in the New Testament of the spoils that have come because the Lord Jesus Christ has overcome Satan. When John had his great vision of the Lord in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation and describes him in those glowing terms, he writes in the 17th verse of Revelation 1, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. Have you ever read that statement before? Well, probably you have. It's the Old Testament description of the eternal Jehovah, Yahweh, the first and the last. Now our Lord takes that term to himself. I am the first and the last. Furthermore, I'm the living one, David's great God. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and as a result of that I have the keys of death and Hades. So just as our Lord spoiled Satan in his victory on the cross, so David spoils the giant Goliath. And finally, Israel enjoys the fruits of David's victory. We read in verse 51 through verse 53, And David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance to the valley and to the gates of Ekron, and the slain Philistines lay along the way to Sha'ariam, even to Gath and Ekron. And the sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. There's one other thing that I think is so interesting. Will you notice verse 46 of chapter 17? David is talking now to Goliath, and he says, This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. Now look at the 47th verse. And that all the assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Isn't that interesting? He will give you into my hands, and everyone will come to know that the Lord has delivered you into our hands. In other words, it's possible that that term champion does mean something like a mediator. And David stands out as the great mediator for the children of Israel. Or to put it another way, I don't want to debate over little words, but let's just say this, for this is surely true. He is the representative. He may not be the mediator. He's the Ish Habenayim. So the Hebrew text says the man of the middle or something similar to that. But he is the one who is the representative of the people of God. And the fact that we have Goliath slain by the way in which he was slain, and then our Lord in the New Testament fulfilling the type, fulfilling the example, but fulfilling it and going beyond it, both historical events, the correspondences, I think, patent and plain, and the predictiveness in the one suggested by the fulfillment in the future, underlines the fact that the master educator of the children of God is the Lord God himself.
And in the dealings with men down through the centuries, he's put his imprint on all the, century, all the centuries for blind men to see. There are only two responses proper, it seems to me, to David's mission in our Lord's. There is the response of alarms. That's the response of proud rejection. We don't need David. And finally, the children of Israel, when our Lord accomplished, was ready to accomplish his work, they say of him, away with him, away with him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. We do not have any eternal king. As the scriptures have said, our king is Caesar. That's one response. That's the response of the man who sits in the audience, hears the word of God preached, and rejects the gospel because he feels no need for the saving work of Christ. The other response, I think, is best illustrated by the response of Jonathan. In the first verse of chapter 18, now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. That's repeated in verse 3. And then we read in verse 1 of chapter 19, Now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death, but Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. In fact, David himself goes on to speak of the love of Jonathan, and I'm sorry, ladies, but David said, The love of Jonathan for me was more wonderful than the love of women. So from trembling at the time David arrived, to hopeful when David went forth, to delivered when Goliath was slain, just as we are delivered, so the writer of the epistle of the Hebrews says, to enriched by the spoils, to devoted to him, from terrified through satisfied to being captivated. I have in my notes a reference to an incident that happened in a Bible class many, many years ago. I was teaching a large home Bible class. We used to have over 100 people in this home. It was a fairly large home. But I remember one night particularly in which in the course of the message I had said something about faith being the means by which we receive Christ. And I underlined the fact as best I could that it is not by good works, not by the ordinances, not by our prayers, not by our education or culture. But then I remember saying, you at this very moment while we are talking, you may receive Christ as your own personal Savior. And there was a lady who came to me sometime after that actually. And uh, I asked her in the course of our conversation when she had become a Christian. And she said, well, if you'll remember in the Bible class, you told us that you could become a Christian right while you were talking. And she said, that's exactly what had happened to me. I had sought a sense of peace and a sense of belonging to the Lord. And while you said that, or as you said that, I bowed my head and received Christ as my personal Savior. It was my privilege to uh, recommend her as a member of the church after her faith in Christ. And I can say the same to you. If you think of our Lord Jesus as having died for sinners and know that you're a sinner, you may receive him as your own personal Savior right now. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are grateful indeed for the blessings of the Word of God and the stories that so marvelously set forth aspects of the great saving work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that if there should be someone in this audience, like Saul and the children of Israel, defeated, terrified, finding no hope of deliverance, in the things that characterize human hopes for deliverance, but desirous of true deliverance. O oh God, so touch hearts that they may turn to him who has offered 
the sacrifice by which sinners may be saved. Give faith and conversion for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you.